this morning. Great to see your beautiful faces. We're in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. I'm going to read these verses, and uh, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says this, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And David wrote this, Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Answer, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who, all, who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this, your word this morning. And, and we do believe with all of our hearts that, that these, your holy scriptures, are inspired by you. And today we invite you into our lives. Please, we pray, teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, is it, it, as it is our increasing desire to mine the truths of wisdom in your word. We pray today that, God, there'd be a, a supernatural and mighty work, that you would bring illumination. Father, today that you would bring revelation. God, we pray that you'd bring these things to us personally and that you'd minister in such a mighty way to our hearts that we today would know the depths of the riches of grace and love which are in Christ Jesus, your son. Father, we we pray today, touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some things in life just get better and better. Um, I want to share with you a couple of those things this morning. You know, I'm thankful that I can say to you honestly and genuinely that, that marriage gets better and better. Uh, Rachel and I just celebrated our 19th anniversary. We've been married for 19 years. You know, it's, it's not that it's been easy and she'd be the first to say that, I'm sure. Uh, but, but I can say to you honestly that I love my wife more today than I ever have. Um, hopefully, she would say the same thing about me. But marriage, uh, as I get older, I appreciate my marriage more and more. It um, gets better and better. I can say to you honestly today that being a dad gets better and better. I'm so thankful for, for our kids and you know, it's so interesting, I remember when we were pregnant with uh, Alex, she was pregnant, I was watching, but, <laughs> but I remember uh, in the church, there were so many people that were saying, oh, you know what, just wait, just wait till the terrible twos. And then, you know, Alec turned two, and I was waiting for something bad to happen, it never happened. And then those same people said, just wait until the teenage years, and I'm waiting for something bad to happen, but it hasn't happened. And pretty soon I'm like, just shut up, okay? Just, what I'm waiting for is for you to shut your mouth. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kind of. But I can honestly say to you, it's not been easy. Certainly there are parts that have not been easy, and we've grown as parents. We're wiser today than, than we were. Um, but I'm so very thankful to be a dad, and I can, I can genuinely stand before you today and, and say to you that being a dad gets better and better. I can say to you today that ministry gets better and better. Ministry gets better and better. You know, we, our backyard is kind of our oasis. It's our, our sanctuary, and, 
um, we were talking on Saturday night, and, and uh, I was just remarking to her, just amazing what God is doing and what God has allowed us to be a part of. And it's not been easy, I'll tell you straight. You know, ministry, and you know this, ministry, serving God, um, is not always easy. It comes at a cost. And there are very significant and great challenges, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I, I look at what God is doing, and I think, God, who are we? Who are we that you would even include us in this amazing thing that you're doing? Ministry gets better and better. Most importantly, I want to say to you this morning that um, my relationship with God just gets better and better. I'm so thankful for him. You know, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I'm in this process of discovery. You know, it's not just that it was good. It's that it is good, and it just gets gooder and gooder. You know, I shared with you this really bad English. Sorry for those of you who are teachers here today. I'm sure I'll get an email. I have no doubt. In fact, I know who they'll come from. I love you and I need you in my life. Don't stop that. But I've shared with you, and we talked about this a little bit last week as I put the study just within the framework of the process of discovery. And I had to do that because, because the portions of Scripture we're, we're dealing with have some significant depth to them. And it's very easy in today's Christian culture to just approach these things in a very shallow way. And it would be a disservice, all right? It would be a disservice to you to do that and not only that but but you can handle it you can handle these deep things and i know that you want these deep things this really is the longing of our heart right we're in a process of discovery i talked to you last week about solomon and and his wisdom that he shared with his son and the exhortation you know he exhorted his son to search for the wisdom of god as if it were like hidden treasure and I use the illustration uh, at some point within the last month. I use it at some study. Maybe it wasn't Sunday morning, but at some study, I said, you know, it's. I use the illustration of that couple that was on a walk, and there was a coffee can that was buried in the ground. The guy saw it, dug it up, ten million dollars worth of silver or, or gold coins, circa Civil War era. And I said, you know, if you knew that on your property there was a can of gold coins worth $10 million, you w wouldn't just get out the shovel. If it was down deep, you'd, you'd rent an excavator, right? Nothing would get in between you and that hidden treasure. And, and Solomon's exhortation to his son, to his boy, was this. That's got to be your attitude towards the wisdom of God, the nuggets of truth, the treasures that are within the Holy Scriptures. We're in this process of discovery, and it never ends for us. You know, somebody once said that the book of Romans is the greatest letter, letter ever written. And, you know, this statement was with respect not just to the past, but to the present and to the future, that this may be, of all the emails ever written, of all the letters that have ever been handwritten, of, of all the letters that have been texted or tweeted or Facebooked or typed, this may be the greatest letter ever written. And you know what? In some sense, I think it's true. There's so much depth to uh, what Paul writes here as it deals with the work of Christ in our life. And I want to sh just share a little bit. I want to remind you a little bit of the context of, um, of, of this particular study as it's connected to last week's study. You can't disconnect this week from last week. And if you weren't here, I want to encourage you to go online and listen. But you remember, we kind of um, distilled last week's study into one sentence that we broke into three parts. As, as Paul was talking about God's righteousness, remember, this, this was really the theme of last week's study. God's righteousness is revealed through Jesus Christ is equally available to everyone, and it accomplishes amazing things in our lives. That was, that was the point of last week's study. We broke it up into three sections. God's righteousness is revealed through Jesus Christ, section number one, is equally available to everyone, section number two, and it accomplishes amazing things in our lives, section number three. And um, I say that to you because, you know, Paul has been pounding away at the brokenness of man. He has been tediously, in a sense, pounding away at the brokenness of man in order to establish the groundwork for God's righteousness through faith. 
He has been pounding away at the brokenness of man, man's inability to fix himself, humanity's inability to fix their selves in order to establish the groundwork for God's righteousness through faith. Now, um, I don't know what your neighborhood looks like, but there's all sorts of construction happening in my neighborhood. Uh, it's not that we're in some massive economic rebound, but nevertheless, you know, construction is, is moving again. And, you know, I want you to think about the way Paul is presenting his theological argument here um, like the way a house is built. We have all these houses that are being put up in our neighborhood. And, you know, when you build a house, the first thing you do here in Las Vegas is you scrape the ground and you make sure it's, it's level. You prepare the ground for the foundation. You pour the foundation, the footprint of the home, and then on that foundation, the next step is what? You begin to frame it, right? You begin to frame the walls. You begin to, if it's a multi-story home, you're, you're framing the floor. Uh, you're putting on trusses. Uh, you're, you're doing the framework. You're framing the windows. Uh, I want you to think about the way Paul presents his theology, okay? There's an order to this that he has. He is, he's scraped the ground. He's, he's, he has um, pounded away at the brokenness of man. He's scraped the ground to establish the foundation. He's laid the foundation that is the righteousness of God through justification. And now today what he's going to do, he's, he's framing the windows. Windows uh, in uh, the Word of God. Illustrations are like windows in the Word of God. Or when I use an illustration, it's like a window through which you see the principles that um, an author is establishing. And and what Paul is doing in these verses is he's framing two windows through which we see the principle of justification by faith illustrated. Two lives that we see this amazing principle of justification by faith illustrated. The first is Abraham, and the second is David. I want to reread verses 1 to 4 as we look at illustration number 1, life illustration number 1, that... that describes for us this beautiful principle of justification by faith. The Bible says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about. I love this. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says this, Genesis chapter 15. It says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as, as debt. So Paul says, let me illustrate this, all right? I want to illustrate this principle of justification by faith through the life of Father Abraham. We call him Father Abraham because he's the father of what? Is he the father of works? Is he the father of religiosity? No, he's the father of faith. How was Abraham justified? Now, let me ask you a question, all right? And this is going to test you this morning. Don't let me down, because I'll be infinitely disappointed if you can't answer this question, all right? What does justified mean? What does justified mean? Yeah, a little louder. Come on, mumble. Don't mumble and think that you're going to get away with looking like you know what you talk about. You're like, mumble, 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 mumble. No, that does not count. Justified, remember we talked about justified. It means it's just as if I'd never sinned. It means to be declared righteous. Now, Abraham was an idol-worshiping pagan. Joshua 24, verse 2. Before he met Yahweh, the monotheistic God who created the heavens and the earth, he was an idol-worshiping pagan. God graciously called Abraham to himself. He didn't just call Abraham out of a land. He didn't just call Abraham away from his family. He didn't just call Abraham to the promised land. Most importantly, God called Ab Abraham to a personal relationship with him. I want you to think about that because uh, later on in Abraham's life, we see that he was in fact called the friend of God. Um, though... God did this work in Abraham's life, though we know Abraham was far from perfect. Though we know he was far from perfect, 
God still did some amazing things through Abraham's life. Um, if human works were the standard, and I say were the standard in quotes because certainly human works are not the standard, and this is Paul's argument here, if human works were the standard, Abraham, as he would compare himself with other people, he might have something to boast about. There were some real moments of spiritual brilliance in Abraham's life. I think about when he was called to offer his son, the son of promise, Isaac, up on the altar, and he bound Isaac and raised the, the knife. There was a moment of spiritual brilliance in this that he trusted God. He was a man of faith. He, knowing that God had made the promise, believed also that even if his son was sacrificed, God would raise him up from the dead. There were moments of spiritual brilliance in Abraham's life, but Abraham was far from perfect. And Abraham, though he had moments, Abraham, even though he might be able to, in a comparative way, boast of his works before other people, he could never boast before God. Now listen to me, because no one can approach God based on their works. I want you to look at your neighbor today and say, no one. Just do that real quick. All right, that's great. Wasn't that a fun exercise today? <laughs> no one is able to approach God based on their works. Let me say it a different way today to you. If justification was a matter of works, Abraham could boast before other men, but because God does not accept works to justify a man, his works earned him nothing. Okay, I'm going to say it again because sometimes, and this is counterintuitive to the religious mind, and, and, and by nature, because we live in this positive and negative reinforcement atmosphere in life, this is very counterintuitive. This is very otherworldly. This is very foreign to us. God does not accept works to justify a man. In fact, our works earn us nothing as far as our standing goes before God. And this, Paul knows, all right? Paul knows when he drops that truth, he knows it's going to create an earthquake. There's going to be a reverberation. There's going to be a pressing against that. And so this is what Paul says in verse 3. I love this phrase, for what does the scripture say? I love that phrase, and you guys know I love that phrase because, you know, that's what this ministry really is based on. Paul says, hey, let's make sure we have a biblical basis for this. I've just shared something that's counterintuitive to, to the religious mind, so let's go back to the Bible because really when it's all said and done, that's all that matters. You and I ha have to have a biblical basis for the things that we believe in. I think more than ever, all right, we're in the midst of a massive cultural shift in our society. And I'm not just talking about secular society. I'm talking about within the church. We are in the midst of a massive cultural shift within Christianity. Today, there are churches that are gathering together, and there are, are many pastors and many churches that view the Word of God as irrelevant. I was listening to K-Wave. You know, we have a, a wonderful radio station, the Wave of Living Water, 98.1. I, I hope you're plugged into K-Wave. It's killer. But uh, we've got a radio program on there. We're thankful for it. I was listening to Pastor's Perspective, and this lady, she called in. She said, okay, I've got a I've got an issue, and I don't know, I don't know what to think. Can you guys help me out? I'm going to a church, and the pastor opens up the Bible, and he reads a verse, and he closes his Bible, and then he talks about something totally unrelated. And in fact, he spends the next 40 minutes talking about stuff that's not even biblical. Is that bad? <laughs> and there was a pause. And, and they said, that's not good. That's not good when clearly that's not good. And she knew, right, the Holy Spirit was giving her discernment. She knew in her heart that that was not really what she should expect from a church that is supposed to be a Bible-believing church. No, when we gather together, the expectation is this, that we are opening the Holy Scriptures and we're talking about things that we actually have a biblical basis for, maybe even more dangerous than the attitudes of some that the Bible is irrelevant is that there are some who are actually revising the, the Word of God 
You know, there is a, a revision today. There are many people who are revising the Holy Scriptures so that they can accommodate a lifestyle that they want to accommodate, a belief system that they want to accommodate. They are literally revising the Bible to make it say something other than its plain meaning. I'm so thankful that Paul makes this simple statement. He says, what does the Scripture say? You and I need to make sure that everything we believe in has a biblical basis and the patterns laid out so clearly for us. He goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 15, and he pulls out this, this scripture, very simple scripture, but, but it says this, Abraham believed God and it was accounted, that uh, word accounting, it, the word accounted is an accounting term. Um, it, it means to calculate, um, it means to have something credited to your account. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, there was a transaction that was through faith whereby God's righteousness was credited to Abraham. Let me put it in more modern terms. There was a direct deposit. I love this. There was a direct, you guys use direct deposit? Isn't direct deposit awesome? You know, what happened here was this. Abraham believed God and there was a direct deposit into Abraham's account of God's righteousness. There was an instantaneous verdict from the judge. Now, Abraham was struggling. You guys know Abraham was battling. Genesis chapter 15, the promise had been given in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham is married to Sarah. She's unable to have children. He's unable to give her children. All he has is Eliezer, who is a servant in the house, and he's battling. He says to God, God, I don't see the fulfillment. You've made this promise, but where's this child? Is it that you're going to bring or fulfill the promise through Eliezer, my servant? And God says to him, hey, hey, buddy. This is my version, by the way. Hey, buddy, get out of your tent. All right, get out, get out of your tent, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to look up. How many stars are in the sky? They're innumerable. And then God reiterates his promise to Abraham. And in that moment, as the reiteration is made, as his focus is taken off of himself and placed on the almighty power of God, Abraham, the Bible says, believed God, just took him at his word, and there was a direct deposit of righteousness put into Abraham's account. That's powerful. You know, I say that this morning, and, um, and of course, Paul kind of, um, in a way, qualifies or develops it a little bit further. We talked about this last week. He says it can't be of works because when you work for two weeks, your employer now owes you for those two weeks of work you've investment, invested. And God is a debtor to no man. God's not giving you his righteousness because you've, you've done something to earn it. It's a work of his grace. Some of you today are thinking, man, that's... That's a problem, Pastor. You know, that sounds too easy. Could it really be that easy? Or some of you are thinking, well, you know, you see where some people are going to take that. You can't teach that because some people are going to take that truth and use it as a license to sin. You know, here's my freedom to sin card. Jesus died for me on the cross, so I can do whatever I want to. It doesn't really matter. You know, we're going to deal with that attitude of false belief later. But if someone's thinking that, if someone is thinking, hey, you know what, he died for all of my sins, I'm forgiven, I can live however I want to, you have to question whether they've really ever experienced Jesus Christ in the first place. How could someone have that attitude and so devalue the sacrifice of, cro of Christ on the cross? How could someone do that and, and still at the same time believe that Jesus paid the penalty for every single sin. You know, I want to say to you today, you cannot modify the doctrine of justification just because there are people who are going to misuse it. The Bible says what it says. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is a great verse today, you know, because maybe some of you are still thinking, well, where do works fit into our lives? How does that fit in? We're going to develop that more when we're in Romans chapter 6. But Paul kind of puts all of this into a synopsis in verse 8 of chapter 2. Notice what he says. For by grace, and a lot of you have this memorized, 
For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is what? Say it louder, it is what? One more time, it is what? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now notice what he says, for we are his workmanship, we're his poema, we are his symphony, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in in them works do not earn our standing before god good works are an expression of worship a genuine expression of loving worship to the god who saved us Uh, in fact jesus said these are the commandments that you love the lord your god with all your heart mind soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself as our lives and i'm going to say this one more time okay as our lives orbit around the doctrine of justification As we understand that our standing before God is not performance-oriented. I'm not earning it. I'm not purchasing it. I'm not buying it. My works cannot earn me. When would I ever be good enough to say to God, I've reached that stage now, God, where my standing before you has been purchased by my good works. It's not performance-based. And when our lives orbit around the doctrine of justification that God God has accounted to us through faith his righteousness. Now it frees me to be able to live the life that God has called me to live. Now, Paul doubles down on this using David as an example. Notice in verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. You may want to highlight or underline that phrase. It's, It's a very important phrase. His faith, that person's faith, is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And he says this, blessed, by the way, that word in Hebrew is in the plural form. So it's blessednesses, all right? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed, plural, blessednesses, is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin so he doubles down now with david and i want you to notice in verse five he presents as far as our standing with god goes he presents works and faith as mutually exclusive he presents works and faith as mutually exclusive it is never a combination of the two you either approach god based on one or the other and only one leads to the righteousness of god being imputed to your account and look he he profoundly i think this is so profound he profoundly establishes this when he says but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies who justifies who say the word justifies who okay the ungodly right Who are the ungodly? (laughs) May God richly bless you this morning, you ungodly people. God justifies. It doesn't say God justifies the godly. The Bible says that God justifies the ungodly before you can do anything. I say this every single Sunday morning. I say you need to come just as you are. You are justified by God in the condition that you come to Christ in. And some of us, when we came to Christ, it was a disaster. It was a mess. You know, the bombs had gone off in our life. It couldn't have been any worse, any darker, any bleaker, any more hopeless. And we came just as we were, and this is what he did in the moment, in that moment. I want, you guys got to think about this, okay? In that moment when the decision was made, in that moment when your confession was declared, in that second, in that instantaneous second when you put your full trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the full weight of your eternal destiny was laid upon him. In that moment, a declaration was made over your life. You were forgiven of your sins, and, do- and God declared you to be righteous before you could do anything you know you come to jesus christ and and god didn't say to you hey uh you've been going to the prayer meeting lately hey you've been going to women's bible study 
hey, you've been given financially, you've been contributing, because you probably need to get some of those things done before you even think you can come to me. I guarantee you today, there's somebody sitting in this room right here, listening online in the overflow, and this is your approach to God. You've come, you know that there are issues in your life, you know there are problems, you know there are things that need to be dealt with, and this is what you're thinking, I'm going to fix this, okay? I'm going to fix this up, and as I fix this up and make myself look a little bit better, then maybe in that process, along the way somehow, God will be able to receive me. God will be able to accept me. And so we put cosmetics over something we could never even fix ourselves. It doesn't work like that. The Bible is very clear. God justifies the ungodly. We come to him just as we are. This was the, the pattern with Abraham. And we're not going to we're not going to reread verses 9 to 12, but the pattern is laid out before he was ever even circumcised. And Paul makes this point. Before he did that religious work, before he expressed the seal of righteousness, of circumcision, God had justified him because of his faith. God did that for two reasons. Number one, so that Abraham could be the father of both Jew and Gentile. And number two, so everyone would know that justification does not come by works. I think about the thief on the cross. I love this example. Here he is, the guy's railing and blaspheming Jesus. And all of a sudden, there's this spiritual epiphany that he has. And he recognizes, can you imagine? Can you imagine he recognizes that this one is in fact the Messiah, the sent one of God, dying for the sins of humanity, crucified right next to you, in between you and another blasphemer. And in that moment, this great epiphany comes, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And his arms are pinned to a cross. Jesus didn't say, well, you know what? You need to go to church first. He didn't say, hey, bud, I'd love to help you, but you need to be water baptized. And that ain't looking good for you right now, so what can I say? Sorry, no luck. He didn't say that. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Period. Justification came by faith even when that man could do nothing. The illustration is like you and me in a court of law. Here we are. We know that we're, we're, we're righteously condemned to death. We know that we've, we've failed. We know that we've sinned. The judge has every right to execute capital punishment. And in that moment, in the realization as the Spirit of God is working, we fall in complete dependence on our face, trusting only in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the judge, as we do that, hits the gavel and declares us innocent of all charges. That is is a miracle of God. It's amazing. In fact, Paul, Paul, Paul pulls from uh, the Old Testament, Psalm 32, your homework, I'm giving you homework, thank you for coming to Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley, the church that gives you homework, your homework is Psalm 32, just to reread re the whole thing, but he pulls from Psalm 32, verse 1, uh, where David says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute iniquity. Now let me give you backstory, okay? Let me give you some historical context because these were not just words. It wasn't like, hey, David was thinking, this is a nice thing to write. I think I'll write this. This is the theme on my heart today. No, there is a backstory here. And this is the backstory. Most scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 32 after he wrote Psalm 51, a psalm of repentance. David was looking back on his life, and he'd come to that place where he'd repented hardcore sin. He'd repented of murder, and he'd repented of adultery, having sexual relationship with another man's wife. He'd come to his sentence, and David in Psalm, he'd come to his senses, and David in Psalm 32 just looks back on that period of time for a whole year. Listen, this morning, for a whole year, David had concealed his sin. David had swept it under the rug. David had stuffed it down. And you, when you read that psalm, David describes for that year what he was going through. The Bible says David's just expressing that he was being eaten away at the inside. He was being eaten away. His bones were, were groaning. He was literally decaying on the inside. 
until he came to that place where he confessed and repented of his sin. And you guys remember the story. David, David was a man who was after God's own heart. But he'd found himself not going out with the army, not leading the army. He was hanging back in Jerusalem. He was on the roof of his house, and he saw a hot babe. And he did the wrong thing. He called her to come over for tea. No, I don't know if it was tea. But he called her to come to the house. He consummated a physical relationship, and she got pregnant. She was married to Uriah the Hittite, one of the greatest soldiers in David's army. David knew he was in trouble. Here, this woman's pregnant. Uriah is, is with the army. He's fighting. And so this is what he does. He, he tries to fix the problem. You know, instead of confessing, instead of repenting, instead of owning it, instead of dealing with it, he calls Uriah back, and he says, buddy, you know what, you've done such a great job, why don't you go hang out with your wife? You know, why don't you guys have a little nice intimate time together? Why don't you work on your marriage? Because he's thinking that if they have sexual relationships, maybe, this is bad, maybe Uriah's going to think this kid is mine. But this guy had so much integrity, he says, listen, far be it from me to do that, to enjoy such pleasure when my brothers are fighting in a war. He slept that night on David's doorstep. David the next night says the same thing to him. He refused to do it. He was a man of integrity. David knew this was not going to solve the problem. So what he does is he sends Uriah back into battle and he tells his general, he says, listen, when the battle is hot, all right, when it is intense, what I want you to do is I want you to pull all of the guys away and leave Uriah on his own. And he did, and Uriah died. David was responsible. David was, res David was responsible for the murder of a man. Tried to cover up this adulterous relationship. You know, I'm, I just want to say today I'm thankful for the honesty of the Bible. I'm thankful for the honesty of the Bible. Some of us here have very rugged testimonies and I'm thankful that God has laid down for us a pathway to come just as we we are and this was what happened Psalm 32 David repented of his sin and as he begins this psalm think about the expression of worship think about the relief that was on David's heart think about how overwhelmed where he has been forgiven of murder and adultery and he pens these words. He said, blessed, plural, blessedness is, total sense of being overwhelmed. The word means profound contentment. The word means true happiness. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Overwhelmed with the blessings of God. An overwhelming state of profound contentment and happiness. Why? Because every transgression every sin and all iniquity when you go back to psalm 32 it's quoted a little different here in the new testament later go back to psalm 32 and david lays out each one of those things it says lawless here in uh the old testament it says transgression but david lays it all out transgression sin and iniquity those things that are willful those things that are conditional just by our very nature we fall short of god's glory and those things that are natural we're born in iniquity it has come through from adam to us and david says this amazing truth all of that all of that has been forgiven let me say it a different way god is not counting your sin against you god does not keep a record of wrong god is not like santa claus keeping a list and checking it twice and trying to evaluate who is naughty and who is nice. If you have put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, God no longer imputes, it's an accounting term, he no longer counts that sin against you. This is what he says. He says, that doesn't count. As far as you're standing with me, Derek, are you saying there are no consequences to sin? Absolutely not. Of course there are. David dealt with consequences. David dealt with other people's perceptions. But as far as his standing with God went, he was not defined by his sin. And neither are you this morning. Charles Spurgeon, it's awesome. Charles Spurgeon, he said this, just as he was commenting on Psalm 32, verse 1. He said, 
Blessedness is not, in this case, ascribed to the man who has been a diligent law keeper, for then it would never come to us, but rather to a lawbreaker, who by grace most rich and free has been forgiven. Self-righteous Pharisees have no portion in this blessedness. Over the returning prodigal, the word of welcome is here pronounced, and the music and dancing begin. A full, this is so good, a full, instantaneous, irreversible pardon of transgression turns the poor sinner's hell into heaven and makes the heir of wrath a partaker in blessing. Isn't that amazing to think about what God has done in our lives? David's life, when you think about David, uh, you do not define David by murder and adultery. The New Testament defines him like this. He is a man after God's own heart. Abraham's life was not defined by his sin or his failure. He is called the father of faith. Esther's life is not defined by her fear. We, we remember the Bible says that she was raised up for such a time as this. Paul, who was a persecutor of Christians, he imprisoned believers, those who followed the way. He literally had them put to death. He consented to the death of Stephen, but his life was not defined by that. He, was, he is remembered as one of the most imminent of all apostles. And I want to say this to you this morning. Your standing with God is not defined by your sin because of Jesus Christ. Your standing with God is not defined by your sin because of your faith in Jesus Christ. You do not have to live your life fettered by your failure. You do not have to live your life identified by your iniquity. You are not in a, a process of penance whereby you are trying to work your way out of those things that you've done that are wrong, hoping that in some way, at some point, God will have favor upon you. Some of you this morning, you're believers in Jesus Christ. There's been failure in your life. Your life has got to orbit around the doctrine of justification. If your life is orbiting around a performance-oriented relationship with God, I want to tell you today, Jesus is not at the center you are. Jesus is not at the center you are. And your life will never be in order. You'll, you'll never know the true fulfillment that God wants to bring. Your life will never be overwhelmed with blessednesses until Jesus Christ is at the center of your universe. And so in the midst of your failure, what do you do? You bring it to the cross. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. It is done. It is dealt with. Are there going to be lingering consequences? Maybe. Are there going to be perceptions that people have that, that they're never going to let us outlive? Possibly. But that doesn't govern our life anymore. Stop living in the past. Stop being chained by your failure. You are not identified by your iniquity. When, when we think this way, when we think this way, this is what happens. We realize that Jesus Christ is everything. When we think like this, it leads us to a place of worship where we recognize that Jesus Christ is everything. Sometimes people may say to us, why are you so crazy about Jesus? And it's like, are you kidding me? All right, really? Do you want me to tell you? Thank you for that open door. Let me tell you why I am so crazy about Jesus. Because I was a lost sinner, hopeless, consumed by my own depravity and wickedness. And he took me just as I was. He didn't leave me that way. Let me, tell you, let me tell you what he has done. He has forgiven me. He has imputed his righteousness to me. My sins and my, my failures... All right, I, let me remind you, this side of heaven, there will be no sinless perfection. This side of heaven, there will be no sinless perfection. Am I accommodating sin in our life? Am, am I saying that that's a justification to do those things that are not right in the eyes of God? Absolutely not. But the reality for you and for me as believers in Jesus Christ, this is so otherworldly, is that as far as our standing with God goes, sin does not stick. I'm that crazy about Jesus Christ because this is what he's done. He's purchased for me a place in heaven. He's purchased for me a place in the family of God. When you read Psalm 32 and you get to the very end, this is what David says, 
Don't turn there. He says this. He says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let me read it again, okay? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let me, let me just... Let me just break it into three things. Be glad, rejoice, shout for joy. I hope you're not one of those miserable weaned on lemon Christians. Oh, this is so hard. And this is just so miserable. And I never thought it was going to be like this. And I'm just, it's just drudgery. It's just difficulty. Really? Is that what it is? Then guess what? Maybe you're at the center of your universe. Maybe you have a performance-oriented relationship with God. Maybe you need to be released and set free from that today. Because if Christ is at the center, this is what happens. Am I saying that it's always easy? No. Am I saying that there aren't times of great difficulty? No. But I'm saying that ultimately, as, when it's, as it's all said and done, when we center our hearts on the doctrine of justification, this is what happens. Be glad, rejoice, shout for joy. Even for those of us Western Christians who are so hesitant to even express, we're just like afraid. Worship service, hands are raised, we're like... <laughs> and our lips, when we sing, we barely even move them because... It's not that we don't have joy in our hearts, it's just that we're not accustomed to expressing it. And I think he deserves it. Be glad, rejoice, shout for joy. Amen. Mm. Father, we, we love you, God. We're so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful today. Thankful, God, for these deep truths that, that resonate, God, that reverberate, that, that break up the fallow ground of religiosity and self-righteousness. And, and, God, that release us and set us free from the fetters of our failure. And, and God, we don't have to be identified by iniquity. Today we find our lives hidden with Christ. In God. And our hearts are, Father, filled with blessednesses. We're overwhelmed, God. We are glad, we rejoice, and we shout for joy. For there is no one like Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Today, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, this morning, maybe, maybe you've never experienced this glorious doctrine of justification. Maybe you've never believed this way in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never fallen on your, your knees in complete dependence, laying the weight of your eternal destiny completely and fully, not marginally, not partially, but totally upon him. Maybe he's not at the center of your universe. Maybe you've not been washed and cleansed and forgiven. Maybe this has been the way you've, you've thought, that somehow if you could just be more moral, here you are at church, it's got to mean something, it has to count. It's a step in the right direction. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's not the step. The step that God wants you to take is a step of faith, believing in the gospel, the good news that God sent his son and his son Jesus Christ did for you and for me what we could not do for ourselves. He died in our place. He took the punishment for every single sin that we will know over the course of our lifetime. He paid the price for our forgiveness. And, and as you believe, as you trust in this God's message, the Bible says that you will be forgiven and his righteousness will be directly deposited into your account. You will have forever right standing with him. Today, 
maybe you need to take this step of faith. Maybe God is speaking to your heart. There's a, a knocking on the door of your heart today, and you know. You know there are things that you've done in your life. You need the forgiveness of God. You want right standing with Him. Today you want to you wanna know Him and the power of His resurrection. This morning, if God is speaking to your heart and you'd just in the quietness of your own heart, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want a relationship with God. I, I want right standing. I realize I can't do this on my own. I want to trust in Jesus Christ. I want to depend upon His sacrifice and His resurrection wholly and completely. I want my eternal destiny, the full weight of it, to be rested on Him. I want the blessednesses of God to pour over my life. I need God's transforming power and work in me. Today, if this is you, you've come to these conclusions because God is leading you, because God is speaking to you. And now today, you need to take a step of faith. It's a step that only you can take. God is not going to force you to take this step. I can't take it for you. The people who've brought you, your family members, Christians in your life, can't take it for you. We can encourage you. But ultimately, this is a decision that you have to make. And today, I believe God is inviting you. He's calling you to make this decision. Today, if this is you, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want God in my life. I know today is the day. I know I need to stop messing around. I need to stop putting this off. I want to trust in Jesus Christ today. If this is you this morning, right where you're sitting, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you today, would you raise your hand? God is speaking to your heart. God bless you, man. Thank you for raising your hand. Anybody else, I want you to raise your hand this morning as God is touching your heart. Just stretch that hand up high. Let me see who you are. All right, you can put your hand down. I'm going to lead you in prayer right where you're sitting today. And I want to encourage you as God is touching your heart to make this your prayer to God, believing with all of your heart and his promise to you is this, that that as you pray and as you believe, he will give you the forgiveness of sins and he will adopt you into his family and he will bless you with the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. So right where you're sitting this morning, make this your prayer to him. Dear God, today I give you my life. Today I confess that I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose on the third day. I believe that through faith in him, you've forgiven me of my sin. You've given to me your righteousness. You've made me your child. God, today, I pray you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to worship you with my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you, man. Awesome. Awesome. Let's all stand together today. Today, if you need prayer, our elders and their wives are on the far sides of the sanctuary. We'd be blessed to pray with you and for you. May God fill you with blessednesses overwhelming this week. May you be glad. May you rejoice. And right now, guess what we're going to do? What are we going to do, y'all? Shout. Shout for joy.